everybody likes the idea of taking something that you're familiar with and turning it into something that you're not as familiar with, like a 18-wheeler semi into Optimus Prime. And so that was the beginning. I joined Hasbro in 2000, and the company was in some degree of difficulty. So we were focusing back on our core brands, and Transformers was one of those brands that we began to really rethink about, and how do we reignite this brand for future generations? I was aware of the TV show, I used to watch it with the kids, but I thought, this is a movie waiting to come out and be dusted off and to be reinvented as a live action experience. I'm going to end your hunger once and for all. We were initially really resistant to the idea of doing it because it's something that we had cared about as kids and that's always kind of a, it's, it's on the one hand really exciting to take that challenge and on the other hand you go like, I don't want to screw this up. The first thing that I sat down with with the writers was a, a, an idea to make this a story about a boy in his car because that's something everybody can relate to. Bumblebee, head for the underground parking entrance. Transformers were always about robots in disguise and more than meets the eye. And that more than meets the eye could mean more than just the robots. More than meets the eye could mean something about the human characters. But there were very few humans that we could draw from. So it meant coming up with characters that didn't exist before. In the original cartoon, there was a, a mechanic character who was kind of the basis for Sam. We kind of looked to movies like E.T. for the way that Elliot became the audience in how we were experiencing the wonder and the magic of E.T. coming to Earth. My first draft actually was just focused on the kids. That's awesome! Steven Spielberg called me right when I was finishing The Island, and he said, I'd like to do Transformers, and I'm like, okay, all right, I'll think about it. Hung up, I'm not doing that movie. That's what I said to myself, I'm not doing a toy movie. I thought about it, and I went to Hasbro in Rhode Island, and uh, they put me through Transformers school. This is the classic G1 Optimus Prime, very much like it was made in the 80s. He had a very simple transformation. Very easy to get from vehicle to robot. We did the full pitch. Robots are not all equal. They're alive, they're sentient men, they have feelings, they have allegiances, you know, there's backstory, there's a conflict, you know, that they are fleshed out characters and that we've had so many eras and there's so much potential that they could pull from to make whatever kind of movie they wanted to make. Something in Transformers just struck me when I was sitting there. I said to myself, if you can make this really real and edgy, and I saw a couple images that were towards the direction that they would like to take this, and I'm like, that's really interesting. So I think right then and there, I was kind of sold on trying to make this idea work. Michael Bay was born to direct Transformers. He was the perfect fit for this concept. I hired a team, probably about 25 artists, different people from different kind of expertise, and, and we were starting to design robots. There was apparently a script. I hear it was way too kitty. No one wanted me to read it because they thought I would quit right then and there. Michael has incredible instincts about what will please an audience. And so as we were developing the script, we would run ideas by him, and we'd say, what do you think about this? I knew I wanted to make it very credible and serious, and I told these guys I wanted to broaden it out and make it so that it had a little more global impact. Much like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Richard Dreyfuss' story is clearly the centerpiece, as Shia LaBeouf's story is the centerpiece of our movie. But then we have two other groups of humans that we follow quite closely. I kept putting in things of, of different action stuff that I saw, and what we do is that we sit down, we bat it around, and uh, they see what I'm really liking and not liking. Once he got into the rhythm of it, he started imagining these incredible sequences. And a lot of what we ended up doing action-wise was very collaborative. He is the sickest action director on the planet. That is something that he is. He's not Ilya Kazan. And Mike will tell you that. There's a missile coming right down that street down there. It's gonna hit that truck right there. The robots are holding it up. Okay, roll cameras. Roll arrows. Space. Ready? Ready? Yeah. And four, three, two, one. Boom. 
Michael staged huge, logistically complicated scenes of massive destruction and explosions. And even when I was watching those dailies without the actual Transformers there, it was just eye candy. In this movie, Michael is the star. And Michael is so much fun. We line everything up with the football. Ready and hike! And three, two, one, bam! Does that work? Thank you very much. You got the timing? That's perfect. Action! I think Bayham's a good word for working with Michael. I mean, we have to be prepared to go in any direction. Get the armor. Take it. Cut. Might show up and he might say, today I want to flip a car. You have to be three steps ahead of Michael. <laughs> Smells good. <laughs> you hear on the walking when I'm walking in, Bay's coming in, he's coming in hot, he's coming in hot. Here we go. Ready. You know, it's all wired because I'm ready to go. When I come into the set, I want to start shooting. Come on, on camera, let's go. He's got a tireless kind of energy, and I understood that that's how he gets into it, and then he's into it. It's like an actor getting into character. Jim, lift him up again and do it again. Do it again. Keep rolling. Got it. Okay. 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 Oh, God. Please don't kill me. Please. Please. Keep moving up. Moving up. Moving up. Moving up. Okay. 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 Jim, lift him up again and do it again. Do it again. Keep rolling. Got it. Mike needs people who can accommodate his needs, and you need to be able to adapt. You can't be the guy who's got the script notes and the and the and the ledger. And no, I can't do that because in the next scene, I can, you can't be that guy. Mike will eat you alive. This ain't gonna. It ain't gonna trust me. I saw it. I stand under it. Trust me, I said. What he is, is he's very honest, he's very blunt, he's very direct, he's very opinionated. Give me a shot, Dave. And he has an amazing visual sense of film. Yeah! He likes to use the megaphone once in a while. Ready, and roll the camera! Three, two, one! Stay there, behind the pillar. No, you're gonna wrong way. The other way, other way. God, he doesn't pay attention to what we're shooting. The thing about it is it's never personal. Oh. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Soul Man? Yeah, buddy. Really? Yeah, Randy. Ah, what? I've worked with a crew, many of the same people, for 10, 15 years. And so they know my style, they know my pace. Hey, Mike! Here we go! There's a lot of success attached to what Michael does, and there's a lot of, of careers that have prospered by being part of the films with him. So he attracts a lot of actors. How do you know you're getting a good shot? I've been doing this for a long time. Well, my producer, Ian Bryce, said to me, well, you, should, you should get this kid Shia. And I said, I thought he was older. So he came in and he actually looked like a 16-year-old. Now tell me what happened. No, no, you said you'd pick me up, no questions asked. I know, that was a deal. Uh, Remember how Greg Graves pretty much flew over the cuckoo's nest? Uh -huh. I think it could have been passed on to me like a mutant with wiki gene. First I was like, wow, they're making a Transformers movie. It's insane, you know? They're gonna mess that up completely. They're gonna screw that up so bad. But when I first sat down with Mike, it was never the discussion of, let's talk about the robots. The first thing he wanted to talk about was, how do we make this real? How do we make these characters come across as honest? Gentlemen, Bobby Bolivia, like the country. I said without the Hershey squirts. Hmm. I gotta help you. My son here is looking to buy his first car. What I like about Shia is he's the everyday dude, but he's great at improv, and he's got a great comic wit. Nice, nice right? It fits me. Shia is one of the funniest people, just naturally. It's hard to get through scenes with him sometimes, though, because he's so good at improv, and he gets like funnier and funnier as he goes. 
I just didn't recognize you. Yeah, well, I mean, that's understandable. You know, I just got back from fat camp. I lost like 80 pounds. Oh, so, well, you know what? That's good for you. Yeah. That's good for you. Yeah, yeah. I learned a lot. And you know, I just. a stronger person. Yeah, physically and mentally. Yeah. Did and you make so, friends? But yeah, I mean, some of them died because, you know, diabetes is really chronic <laughs> there. But uh, I, I mean, like, there's three or four that I kept in contact with, and they're really good people. You know? Because fat people aren't bad people. <laughs> and that's one of the main things they teach you there. It's hard for me to try to not laugh because I get in trouble because we won't ever make it through a scene. I just put that light in. <laughs> Most importantly, I think he can keep up with Bay. Bay is constantly evolving the characters, is constantly throwing something different at you. My first scene actually was with the dogs. It was like, welcome to Michael Bay's set. Release the hounds. You need to stay hidden until I tell you, okay? Yes, yes. The trainer's worried about your ass, but we are insured at DreamWorks, the Paramount. <laughs> you know, it's your first day. Hey, welcome. And the whole crew's like, hey, nice to meet you, and action, and you're running. The dogs started getting smart after a while, and instead of stopping at camera, the dogs kept chasing Shia. Fortunately, Shia ran past me about 30 miles an hour, and I was able to grab the long chain that was attached to the dog. Thank God Shia's a fast runner. All right, because that thing wasn't stopping. It was going to clamp down on that poor kid's ankle, I'm telling you. That would have been the end of, of, of me in this film. It would have been the first day. Bay talked about um, how hot Michaela was going to be. We talked about finding literally the most gorgeous 18-year-old there is out there, which I think we did. I think we did. I think we did. Oh, God, if Trent could just see me right now. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what? You just say if Trent could Trent, see me right yeah, now? Yeah, if Trent could see me right now. This is crazy. We interviewed a lot of different young women for this, and yes. Megan, I don't know, I just liked her look. I liked that no one really knew about her. I think Shy helped her out. I think the energy between them, I think it kind of works. Hope I didn't get you stranded or anything like that. That's uh, fine. So uh, I was wondering if I could ride you home. I mean, uh, listen, I was headed this way, figured, you know, I'd ask you if you want to ride or not. You know, I'm just putting it out there. Okay. Yeah, don't say it's fine, just kind of a <laughs> nod. The only thing Mike asked me when uh, I was reading with him and auditioning, he just asked me if I could run. He's like, can you run? I was like, well, yeah, I think so. And the other thing he asked me, he goes, do you have a nice stomach? And I said, well, in my opinion, yes, I do. So I figured right, I'm going to be running, hopefully not naked, but I'll be running in a belly shirt, maybe. Go. Megan did good with all the running and jumping and cars skidding and everything else going on. I think Megan really hung in there. Drop. Just from filming, I've put on like almost 10 pounds of muscle. Hey guys, give me a 30 pad right here. 30 pad, coming in. Come on, come on. All right, we're off the roll camera. All right, here we go. And now, look back at the next time. Here we go. That's good. That's good. Let's go to lunch. <laughs> My wife on? Yes, Captain. We needed a leading man. Yeah. We needed a leading man. There were lots of great actors out there, but leading man is very different from just a good actor, and Josh encompasses that. I'm thinking I might win an Academy Award for this role. No, I don't want a premium package! Come on! Come on! Fall back! Best screaming in a movie. Lennox! Oh, water, thank you. Give That's me right. chocolate. <laughs> you got chocolate? Say, so give me chocolate. You got chocolate? You got chocolate? I liked him as a person because he was just, he was like very American, kind of no BS, just kind of a, just a nice guy. Colonel Moore offered me the opportunity to go up in a T-38 today. A lot of these military guys were very much like Josh, so I thought it worked really well. Yeah, I'm with the, I'm with the, I'm with the top dog. <laughs> You'll be fine. I had to go through about four or five hours of training, and you know they basically tell you, okay, this is what's going to happen if you have to eject from the seats. I had to change shorts after I left that training. <laughs> I get to fly in a T-38 today. Not too snug, but not too loose. Hold tight. 
And that snap rolls from bottom to top. Take a breath, hold it, please. And that's how it sits. I am happy if I get a chance to show what we in the Air Force can do and what great airmen we have. It was one of the most exciting things I've ever done. And he let me actually fly it a little bit. He's like, okay, turn it 10 degrees and we'll go down to 1,500 feet. I didn't throw up once. <laughs> Tarnisha, Tanisha, and Keisha. <laughs> They're laughing at my daughter's name? Yeah. Damn, get me home. <laughs> All right, cut. All right. Hey, Mark. All right, cut. Tyrese, he paid me to be in this picture, so um, I took his money. Commonly, when you start movies, I make a mistake, too, when you just, you just take too long. Right. Michael Bay, it keeps everybody on edge so we can all stay sharp and on top of our game, because he's on top of his game, and, uh, you know, if you don't step up, you get left by the wayside. Ready? Action! Hello, do you hear me? You hear me now? Hello, 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 hello. No, I got no bar. I got no bar. <laughs> I had a little situation right before I started filming. I just got sick, really sick. And I ended up missing like the first three days of filming. So to get back on the set after all of the warnings and precautions my doctor hit me with, and to be in Alamogordo was just crazy. 120 some degrees, white sand bouncing, the sun, bam, can't even look at the sand because it was so bright. Just hot, hot for no damn reason at all. I've always wanted to work with him. John Turturro. And I'm really glad I did, and I was intimidated the first day working with him, and uh, I got on with him very well. Rolling. Ready, and action. Your son's the great-grandson of Captain Archibald Wickety, is he not? It's with Wiki. With Wiki? With Man to the premises, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely been enjoying myself. So I feel like I've been able to be a little creative and imaginative. Sometimes you don't get a chance in a really big film. Hey, hey, hey! Get that thing to stop, huh? Looking at us, looking at us. Get that thing to stop! I love working with Totoro. He's a funny guy, and he does phenomenal impressions of people in the business, and he knows everyone. He does a Scorsese imitation that'll just bring the house down. Every film I ever made is flashing through my mind. It's a child, a hustle, it is. This is something on my mind. It's Paul Newman. How am I going to direct? <laughs> she did it. She did it. She's the one you want. She's the criminal. Okay, look, look, look. look. I, I wear a wire. I, I, I'll turn state's evidence. I, I do whatever you need me to do. Okay. For you, or for anybody. Michael will come in and tell us what he likes and what he wants, conveyed in that, and you know, let's just try to have some fun with it. Come on, come on, focus, Glenn. Now the thing's gonna whiz by, ready? And zing! Whoa! What was that? Oh, I got a family history of heart trouble. <laughs> he gives us the freedom, and, and we have fun, and Steven Spielberg was on set and said that he had been watching dailies. Hello. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Who wrote that? I did. I did, Steven. You know, I didn't even charge you for it. I'm gonna charge you on the next one, though. I'm Sam Witwicky. Maggie, hey. Did you say Witwicky? Yeah. Both girls needed to be drop dead gorgeous. And there's gorgeous with the right persona, too. <laughs> In this film, I wear like six inch stilettos and I have been running away from aliens, keeping up with John Turturro, John Voight, Anthony, the whole gang in heels, I might add. I challenge Michael Bay to direct for one hour in those things. Point it away from her just a little. Rotate the gun. Rotate the, right. the gun. There you go. Just like, not too far. Yeah. Okay, ready? 
I'm kind of a pacifist, you know, like I don't really like the whole action movie gun thing, it's kind of very anti-weapon. But God, it was fun. I'm a signals analyst. Then send a signal then. Come on, you punk. Love John Voight because he's a great actor and he's a great guy to hang around with and he's just a passionate guy. I like working with passionate people. Okay, so I'm gonna do, do this here. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, come good, in here, good, good, and then I'm gonna come in yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll jump in into here. Sure, right, right, right. Yeah. I'm a little old to be playing this kind of game for the kids, but I love the physicality. I do it roll and tuck with a gun in my hand. <laughs> it's funny. Everybody says, did you see what John did? And I say, hey, fellas, I'm not going yet. I'm still in, still in the game here. Take that moment and make it a moment. Give me one chamber now! John was fast. He outran me, and he was in, like, penny for shoes. I don't know how he did that. I think a documentary about John Voight. There he is in all his glory. It's a creature in his natural habitat. Man's a legend. Do a little wave, John. A little wave. A little wave for the camera. Would you be so kind? Both Johns. You talk to both of them, and geniuses, you know? The guys know how to do this. I've had a good relationship with the U.S. military for many years, and I was dead set on getting the military to cooperate. We went through basic training for three days at Fort Irwin, in, uh, just outside of Barstow. Good morning, gentlemen. We have a set call with the Army. Sweet. Is everybody happy? <laughs> We took the guys out to the 50 caliber machine gun range. And some of the guys, I don't think, had ever even seen a weapon fire, and certainly had never fired one. We were fortunate enough to let them observe the firing, and uh, we put them through a little safety course. Your round will get into place. You'll let it forward, and then one shot at a time. Gotcha. Put the first link in like that. Right. Close feature. Yeah, pull it to the rear, then let go. Let go. And then do it again. All right. You ready to rock and roll right now? What's that? Nice. All right. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Vietnam. Carlos Hathcock once made a kill from a, just under two miles away with one of these. He had a scope mounted on top of him. He's a Marine Corps sniper. Just under two miles, he two made a shot. Two miles away. Two miles away. This thing has a maximum, the bullet will travel a maximum effective range of about 7,200 7, yards. They shoot down airplanes with these in World War II. Check this out. <laughs> this is my first one. Uh -huh. Two, three, four, and then five. All right. I got better. Of course, they were fed in the field. They got to, to eat their, the MREs, and they got real food, too, but they got a little taste of what the military is all about. For me. Free Mari is a meal ready to eat. The entree is the main meal. I can't tell which one's the main meal. Probably the one in the cardboard oh, okay. box. Okay. <laughs> we are cooking, and this is the MREs, which are surprisingly hot. Uh, what the colonel is explaining to me is that it's basically like Drano, but you don't eat the Drano. And then um, if you get the opportunity to ever do this, it smells like garlic farts. Um, the chemical reaction smells like garlic farts. And at first, uh, when I walked over there, I thought it was Tyrese. <laughs> so, I'm really glad it's not, because we're going to be working together for a long time. Uh, all right. I'll trade you my, uh, my jalapeno oh, cheese, cheese for your uh, crackers and jelly. Now, that's a good deal. I'll take all that right. down. Look at this. Chicken cavatelli. Is that bad one? Just like spago. What we call PPE. Yeah, PPE is uh, personal protective equipment. This right here is called IBA, the individual body armor. This is the standard weapons that we use right here. It's called the standard M4. Well, we're going to be going over is the formation you use before you enter a room. So, uh, can we play any Rolling Stones? Uh, no, we have 
We went to a mock Iraqi village. A unit was getting ready to deploy to Iraq, and we spent the afternoon with them and seeing what they do to prepare. So they teach you how to um, stack and go into a room and clear the whole room. Probably get into some of this. <laughs> you know, right, that's what sex. You're looking out this way, you're looking out this way. Until they start to move, it's you're the last man in the stack. Turn around. All right? Contact. You want to meet them, all right? That way everybody knows they're all, all touched up. All right? Hold on. Let me slow. Right? When you're coming in, just like this, all right? You're trying to jump. Can I do this? Yeah, you did it. You did a little did hop. It, you did a little hop. All right, you come in. You clear. You did a little hop. Does that feel more smooth for you guys? Yeah, it does. All right. I mean, because that's it's all sexy. Bullets travel down the wall six to eight inches. All right. If a bullet hits right here and it's traveling down the wall, due to the spiral of the round, it will travel down that wall six to eight inches. So you want to keep your ass off the wall six oh. to eight inches. All right? Mother I wish you would! <laughs> Try me! All right, you scan the windows here, you scan the door, windows, door, windows, door. Scan, scan. Freeze! Nobody move! Status! One up, two up, three up, four up! All clear! We worked our ass off. And sometimes between breaks, we would go, well, where's Tyrese? He was in the van, air conditioning. Hurry up! Everybody is leaving you! You are dying! You are killing them! You really walked away with the respect for the amount of preparation that goes into, you know, being a soldier in the military. Right over here. Great. Awesome. Today is going to be all about an insertion into this village, okay? I get involved in the training phase uh, of, of the actors and making sure those guys at least are comfortable looking. Stop! Move! So, Gunner, you are no good to us back here. You must be up front. We wound up recruiting a bunch of active duty SEALs, so they're current in their tactical capabilities. I see how my weapon's up here, yeah. in front of my face? That's what we call the bubble, okay? I got control of my weapon. I can see my magazine well, okay? Yep. My weapon up here like this. I can still track my targets, whatever. Right. It also acts as a bit of a shield, too, you know? Shut up, dude. <laughs> Michael really wants to bring as much military um, realism into the movie as possible. A big part of that is to use military people to play military people. The entire crew we got speaking words. Michael liked them and wanted to change the scene on the spot. We approved it and they got speaking roles out of it. Okay, let's send the A-10s danger close situation. And make sure there's friendlies in the area within one kilometer. Tech and switch one one to hog one one to strike. The extras that we used from the from Holloman Air Base uh, were off duty and they were paid extras uh, salaries. The United States uh, Air Force and Marines and Army, everybody. I love you all dearly. I'm so proud of what you're doing for us. It's unbelievable. Okay, both here and over there. So just keep it up because you're well loved and you got to know that. Typically, an extra would not have any experience with a weapon. These guys are very experienced with weapons. I think I'm going to open you up more. Just go to your right. Go to your right, right over there. Probably had um, like 200 military and about 50 stun people running and scattering, firing, and being chased by tumbling vehicles that were on cables. Ultimately, zero is our key sweet spot. Zero. zero. If I give you a five, four, my guys will start firing and moving. Right, gotcha. Five, four, three, four, four three. Two.
even though it wasn't a real explosion, it certainly uh, created oh, the effect. <laughs> and, and trust me, as a professional who knows all about blowing things up for real, we appreciate anything like this. I like shooting stuff real on set. It seems to be a dying art. We put actors in situations where we know it's so safe, but it looks very dangerous. Careful about putting your hands down when you put the stop. Okay. Weapon is hot. Full load. Here we go, man. Take two of the hot. Fire in the hall. Guys, look it up. Clear it out. Ready, and let's roll camera. the audience inside the action. And the closer we get to it, and, and the more movies we've done together, the more that we capture that for the audience. Told Shia, you know, you better get in shape for this. I was at 1.30 when I got the role, and it wasn't like I pulled a Christian Bale and completely transformed, but I put on 25 pounds of muscle and then slimmed down throughout the filming. So it's not reassuring that they put bulletproof safety <laughs> on the camera. <laughs> and you're gonna be right in front of you. And right there also, you see? They make sure they protect the uh, cameras, but actors, expendable. We had this scene where he's facing off against Megatron. Is it fear or courage that compels you, fleshly? And the producer, Ian Bryce, he knows how I like physical stuff, and he says, so we're gonna do that blue screen, right? I said, no, we're doing that real. He said, really, really? I said, yeah, we're gonna put him out there. They can build Optimus Prime. It's all good, bro. They can blow up the Pentagon. They can't find a way to keep Shia off the ledge. Right, Michael Bay? All right, ready? Yeah, well, just relocate. I gotta tell you, it's scary going out there because you literally have no safety net and you just have these silly wires hanging on your hip. And mind you, I would never do this myself, ever, okay? Oh, shit. You're locked in, you can't fall, you see that? You're bolted to a steel IV with another pole. What I could is I could fall and scrape off the side and we'd have to pull you up. That could happen. I'm not gonna die, obviously, but I could scrape. You know, this is Fear Factor. That's all it is. It's Fear Factor. That's Fear Factor. It's like, this is like People don't die on Fear Factor. Yeah. This is another episode of Fear Factor. They do more hairier stuff with Fear Factor than this. You're right, you're right, you're right. All right, let's do it. Oh, mother f Got it? Kenny, bring him around this way, too. Come way out, towards us, towards the other way. Towards us, towards us. Get the crane, the crane. Ready, to the camera. Ready, and action shot. Why lose it? You're never gonna get it! You're never gonna get this Osborne! You know that! I'm never gonna give you the Osborne! I feel like a fruitcake saying that, Mike. It's a line. Now you can see the robot in the side. Get the robot in the background. Uh, uh, oh, whoa! No, 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 no. Okay. Mike! Yeah! Are these just close ups? No, they're wide. No, we, we see, see your you face. Head. We see your face, and we're showing that it's you, and we're showing that it's not a platform. Because if it's just close up, we can do that anywhere. That's lame. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. OK. Oh. Oh. No, I'm done, Mike. My, my voice is gone. Okay. Good. Shia is good. He's a good kid. Good kid. <laughs> He's got a lot of heart. You going to back up? 90% of the actors in this business could not do what we did on this film. They just wouldn't do it. 
You know, there's action stars who don't get up on the roof and do what we do. Oh, oh no, 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 no. This movie has really excelled. I'm gonna say and fire, okay guys? You can hear me, right? And it required pretty extraordinary sized things, whether it's white sands. Fire! Or, or the Hoover Dam. We're gonna shoot something quick, and we're gonna go to lunch, and then we are going to go downstairs. Or downtown LA. Ah! finally saw what a 32-foot robot looked against a two-story house, suddenly you realize you've got to find places that are enormous to make these things feel part of the environment. You can't leave the trucks on the road. That's what I'm led to believe. What? On the side of the road. Because? Behind the dunes, so we can't see them. There's going to be a mini base camp down there. Right? Yeah, we're working on that right now, just to find out how we can make it firm enough uh, to work in progress. Every day is a roller coaster for me. I, I, I don't know if it's the same for every department, but you know, I find myself on the verge of tears one minute and then hysterical laughter the next. Ilt, a new guy I worked with, I thought I was going to give the guy a heart attack. I have a question? Yeah. He's just, I, 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 can't, I can't get the observatory. It hasn't been shot in five years. And I said, it's a big movie. You can do it. Go to the mayor's office. You can do it. This is the path. See right in there? This is where he's running. And the Blackhawk's going to come right up on that edge there. Can we even so is do there that? A helicopter running there? Yeah. A, a plan? Yeah. 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 Should be okay. but I, I can't get the bridge with four helicopters underneath. I said, you could do it. Go to the mayor's office. It's a big movie. We're keeping this film down in California. We structured the budget in order to keep it in the United States, which is not to say that the movie couldn't be made elsewhere. It's just, uh, I think, easier and more comfortable for Michael to have, you know, a crew around that he's used to. Hey, Dave. Yeah. I think we'll let them fire this way so you can whip you guys here in hell. You can at least kind of, like, in here, keep it like, you know what I'm saying? I actually cut my fee so that I can shoot here with my crew that knows how to shoot fast and, and, is, and is good on the fly. Right, so it's good to go. So as soon as the plane hits the ground and stops, we should pull the vehicles forward. Michael likes to go hard and fast. He has the shock and awe approach to, uh, to scouting, which is supposed to be... Um... Oh, no, that's not Michael. That's a stealth bomber. Uh, Holloman Air Force Base is an extremely secure base with a great deal of uh, secret goings on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this morning, you know, they, we had a guy with an M16 protecting the AWACS because even though they know that they're here for us, they're still very protective of their aircraft. If the American military is called on, they will fight enemies abroad or even alien robots, if need be. You know, I want scrub brush by it, you know, tumbleweed, whatever, okay? I can show you how to get some better shots. What's that little, uh... uh... Driving into the center of White Sands, which is 300 miles, it's not literally sand, it's a crystal. To see that for miles and miles, there's no other place like that on Earth. White Sands missile range was created for the atomic missile tests in the 40s. And we had to make sure that there was no chance of somebody literally stepping on a landmine. So we had to engage the services of an unexploded ordnance company to mine sweep to a depth of four feet so that we could build our Bedouin village and then ironically blow it up. <laughs> we 
when we got here and laid out the buildings, we realized that the dunes were moving. So the valley was actually significantly smaller, up to 30 feet, because of the wind. Very hot. Uh, we had days 115, 118 degrees. That's the max so far. It could get hotter. And that's compounded by the fact that the sand there is really just white quartz that's washed off of the surrounding mountains, and it just reflected like glass. God! Hot. I'm from Puerto Rico, so when I was told, careful, New Mexico's pretty hot. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I go, I'm from Puerto Rico. How hot can it get? It's hot. I almost had heat stroke yesterday. That's kind of wild. It was hard because they had a lot of gear. Go, go, go! Running and yelling and shooting. Because on my sets, it's like, especially if you're doing military stuff, it's tough. <laughs> I'm not like a very cushy director in terms of if we're here, we're here because I shoot really fast. It, you have no idea how big it is. Hoover Dam is just massive. We had to do some sort of remedial work because a film that shot there last year didn't endear themselves to the Hoover Dam by buzzing the dam. It's a grave situation, gentlemen. Thank you for being with us. Good. Good again? Good. That's okay, leave it. Ready? Something like that, homage. Off camera! They really weren't into it at all, especially, you know, given Michael's penchant for blowing things up. <laughs> so we, you know, worked out with the Hoover Dam. We'd get certain hours early in the morning where we could be up on the top of the dam. Oh, Got it if you can, brother. Okay. Trying to get back over there. They say it's over there. It's like gold. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going down. Push time. Take those ramps down with us. Okay. Push time, push time. Come on, Scotty, you and me right here. And then as soon as the crowds came around 10 o'clock, we had to then go inside or down below. So we just scheduled our way around it, and, and it actually worked out fine. Both of you guys go on this side. At 20. Where's John? You're not puking, are you? The scale of the Hoover Dam was a, a tall order. There's not many places you could do that because everything there is so gigantic. I think we became very familiar with the architecture, which allowed us to build a set that tied into it. What is this? When I looked at this Megatron hangar, this illustration, I'm like, that's the vibe of the movie right there. And it's amazing how one or two illustrations can just set the vibe. We use the playa hangars where Howard Hughes built the Spruce Goose. And it's this great wood structure. It's kind of narrow, but it's very tall ceilings. You're able to build a lot of different sets so you can go back and forth you know, in this kind of huge space, but it's kind of separated and it's a great place to film. Basically, we were sort of using the structure as it was and then embellishing and sort of making it look like a vintage facility again in a subterranean setting under Hoover Dam where Megatron was frozen in ice. Even though Megatron had been encapsulated in this space, for many, many years, he's still being maintained. So it was a little bit of like new technology mixed with old technology. Very much like Hoover Dam is. When you go in, there are things that have never changed in there. The first time I walked onto the Megatron set, I said, wow. Megatron. I had my son with me that day. When he saw Megatron up there, his jaw just dropped. I was so impressed with it that on my weekends, I would sneak onto the set with my friends just to see it. You know, he was 30, 35 feet, and he was only half built. Like, I'd bring three or four friends, you'd be like, you're never gonna believe what they just built. I never do that. I mean, I never do that. This baby's the first we found. 
want to just delay that, or so, so you can watch? No, no, no. no, no, no. You're right. Okay. So I just stood, but just louder and more, more off the cuff. This baby's the first we found. Boom. Yeah. Get out of here. I saw that set, I suddenly went, oh lord, this film is going to be everywhere. That was the first day that it dawned on me that I was shooting a really big American film. I had to shoot in Los Angeles. Now, Los Angeles, they'd give us four blocks one Saturday, they'd give us three blocks this Sunday, they'd give us those other four next, a weekend from there, and then we shot at Universal Backlot, and then I shot in Detroit. And I had to all make it feel like it's one place. So you had to keep the scene in your head. I mean, you just had to wrap your head around it. Downtown LA is a, a venue for this kind of action stuff. We'll go on five, four, three, two, one, blow up. Go hot, please. Go hot, here we go. Guys, he's right up by this building right here. Ready, and he's right on top of you, moving around, ready in three, two, one, action, listen. but was flying the helicopters under the bridges. For lots of reasons, not least of which is the Homeland Security thing. If you fly helicopters under 500 feet, then the FAA uh, makes you jump through a lot of hoops because of the, you know, the potential for crashing into neighbors. What are you doing? We are, um, we're getting pissed on for the next three days. You know, the helicopter's flying low, pick up all the water from the L.A. River. Nobody knows exactly where that water is coming from. See all this water right here on the floor? It's all man piss, okay? And what happens is a science thing. When you put helicopters over a puddle of man piss, man piss gets all over your man body. Stop! Please, stop! So we all had goggles and face masks on um, so you don't breathe it or taste it. Just piss all on my face, all on my, all my features, piss on my arms, piss all over my own piss. <laughs> it's just nasty. Hi, Deaver. Oh, yeah. It's been a location-heavy movie. It's been a great challenge, and it's funny how, you know, the rose-tinted glasses effect applies. I remember I've been on other shows where I finished, I thought, God, thank God that's over. But as time goes by, you sort of somehow mentally edit out the bad bits and you remember the, the times when there were bombers flying over your head or just being out in the sand dunes late in the afternoon in the beautiful sort of evening light. growing up, uh, I was very into fixing my own cars and taking them apart. And so from cars and just being an automotive head, Transformers, it just it kind of struck me as something fun to work on. Watch out, get out of the way, I'm rolling cameras. Ready, and I'm no guy, go. Ready, and send them, Kenny. Michael Bay does know his cars. He's pretty particular about the cars he wants. Um, he, can, he knows a lot more about cars than I do. Not too fast.
was started last September, October, having meetings with Michael, trying to figure out what the Autobots would be, what vehicles we would use. And we downloaded every picture of every car that was available. We started kind of addressing the major car companies. Listen, you, when you're making a movie for 145 million, and which is, sounds like a lot of money, it was tough to fit this movie in that box. And you couldn't afford to do this movie without a sponsorship, and nobody could come up with what GM has. For us, it is about you know the sexiness of their cars. I went to GM and I got into their Skunk Works there. It's a place uh, I can't tell you where it is, but that's where they make their stealthy uh, concept cars. But I saw this car. They didn't know what kind of car it was going to be, but now it's the Camaro. And what I liked about it, it kind of had a retro look. It was a muscle car, and I just right then and there, I knew it was Bumblebee. Bumblebee was, in the 80s, a Volkswagen bug. And his role has always been kind of the, the younger of the Autobots. We knew that he was originally a Volkswagen and uh, a Beetle, but it was not really an option for Michael because it wasn't badass enough. I just was never going to use the Volkswagen Bug for Bumblebee. It just wasn't going to be in my cars. It just reminded me of Herbie the Love Bug. But, but we do make nod to it in the movie, because if you notice on the parking lot, the Camaro is actually parked next to a bug. This is a classic engine right here. I sold a car the other day. Oh my god. Gee. Bumblebee, we said, you know, as long as he's yellow, let's find some cues that will harken back to what people remember but let's not have that be as far as you can go. I think the Camaro, the old Camaro, is really cool, and, you know, it's a, a nice beater car. The, the quintessential Camaro is a 69. You know, everybody's been a million of them hot-rodded, and so I kind of wanted to find that, you know, like, like the cheesiest version of the Camaro that would be perfect for this kid's first car. If he didn't have any money, he would never go out and be able to afford a 69. This is a Camaro, 1977 Camaro. Nobody wanted them, nobody needs them. They're hard to find. Uh, this one was pulled out of Palmdale. The other two were pulled out of uh, Oklahoma. Uh, we're going to redo them, repaint them, new engines, everything redone so that Kenny Bates can uh, drive the heck out of him for his stunts. So this was kind of like, you know, the perfect dichotomy for the new Camaro when he rescans. What? Does he transform back into this piece of crap Camaro? Oh. Whoa! Ah! That Camaro is really spectacular. I wish they were bringing it out in earlier than they are. There were only two Camaros that were hand-built by GM. To fix that car is a big deal. If you smash a fender, you just don't get another Bumblebee fender because there aren't any. All the parts were individually made. It's a three-stage paint. If you get a ding in the door, you have to paint the whole door. That was a pretty trick door latch. No indent, no recessed area. Everything's slick. I mean, it's a $500,000 car. So it's not like, hey, go have, you know, go around the, the you know, it doesn't happen like that. It's there's wipe your feet off before you get into the car, keep your hands on the steering wheel, you know, push down at a certain rate. You want me to go faster? I'm just nervous about the car. I can go faster if you want. Just don't have to keep my... Don't go faster, just go a little more, just center. You're, yeah. looks, you're, you are not a stunt driver, okay? This is where we were parked, originally. You, know, you can say everything you want. Michael, oh my goodness gracious! Let's go, come on. All right, right here in the center. <laughs> if I crash into the wall, it's not my fault, you know? because I'm an actor. <laughs> but it should be like this, the transformation. One, two, three. OK? Hey, guys. Max, Jake. You're transforming on three. I'm going to go one, two, three. OK? Ready? I mean, Jazz is a character that was always a sports car. Now he's not a Porsche 911 anymore. He's a Pontiac Solstice, but he's still a cool sport car. We had a little company uh, do some aftermarket. 
made a um, hard top for it. We put the little ground effects fairings, we put a little spoiler on the back and some louvers on the hood, and we kind of just jazzed it up a little bit. Ratchet in the 80s was an ambulance, but it was a more of a van shape um, ambulance. It was more of a Japanese version of what an ambulance is. Ratchet was the kind of H2 based ambulance, which doesn't exist, that we kind of designed and built from scratch. We started with a stock uh, GM uh, H2 Hummer, and uh, which we gutted and you know took all of the existing components from the rear from the rear apart, mm -hmm. and then uh, we're building the cages that will be sheeted to you know look as the search and rescue vehicle should. Mm -hmm. um, also applying all of the roll bars, roll cages, you know the heavy duty bumpers to give it that beefy look, you know wheel and tire packages. Um, and the accessories that will, you know, follow with, you know, fall in line with a search and rescue vehicle. Ironhide was this big, you know, 4500 series GMC. They are brand new, they just came out, and uh, they gave us three of them. We got them from the factory black and made that tailgate that had the Autobot logo embossed into it, added the stacks and the, all the running board, and modified the bumpers and stuff. I mean, that truck, if, unless you're standing next to it, you have no idea. It's like so big, it's crazy. It's like the biggest thing you ever saw. There's Optimus. I saw a picture of a truck and uh, it was lowered and it was uh, blue and it had flames on it. And I'm like, that's Optimus Prime. With Optimus, I mean, literally we got every car book, every car pictures, I mean, it was just all over the walls. You know, we looked at the cartoon, thank you very much, and then uh, we, um, just started pulling reference of different big rigs. This is what we were always, everybody in this department was conceptualizing how Optimus is masked, what he came out of. It, this is the main dude, we so we should, we should go look, look at it. it. Okay. Instead of buying a new truck that's a $150,000 truck, we bought some older trucks, and uh, they were pretty beat up, and they were pretty ugly looking. Well, I mean, this is like a redo. You know what I mean, Ian? Yeah. How are they ever gonna make this thing look like that? I said, just. Trust me, this is the truck that it should be Optimus Prime, not a new new truck. This is the one. So we're going to completely strip it, paint it, flame job, new fenders, new sleeper, new bumpers, lights, yada, yada, yada. And when it comes out, it'll be beautiful. You know, there's been some debate about some of the changes that were made. You know, the flames on the side of the car and the fact that it's a long nose instead of a flat nose truck. I like the flames. And what the flames did when he, when he was transformed, it kind of looked like ribs. And it just, it just, to me, it looked cool. One of the things I've learned is red doesn't photograph well in, for the feature films. Um, the light being what it is, and it's, it's a nightmare. Michael Bay was nice enough to explain that to me. So we made this compromise where we wanted a red chest, and we did that by the flames, so that we could still retain the essence of Optimus being a red truck while you know, still making it easy to shoot. Just a much more aggressive looking truck. You know, it's like more dual, you know, more homage to Steven. Looks better on a wide angle when it extends back, you know. It's just a much more badass looking thing than a flat fronted, you know, trash truck. 
And again, it goes back to that thing of when you actually see it and you see what's required of the transformations and the level of detail, we weren't going to be able to have as exciting a transformation with, with the flat nose. OK, guys, come on. Let's stop admiring the truck. Let's shoot, shall we? <laughs> this is a truck that we saw on eBay. Let's set up for this, please. Back to one, Joey. This movie. I had more cooperation from GM than any movie I've ever made. They promised us they'd give us the flood damage cars, the non-saleable cars, the cars that Michael Bay needs to wreck every day on a daily basis for his food chain. close to 200 cars. Yes, we're going to try, I'm going to try and go to the We had like 30 or 40 cars sent to the shop and stripped the engines and transmissions out and put the, the, the pick points on them and the plates on them for us to flip and throw. And we do that all on, uh, on the day, wherever X marks the spot. We have this catapult, and then we just run a cable out, hook it up to the car, and then we, uh, with the uh, use of high pressure nitrogen, we can fire. It's the same way a plane is launched from an aircraft carrier. We do this exact same thing, only on a smaller scale. And it's all like portable. And we'll take that anywhere on the set Michael wants to go and, and we'll launch cars. Screaming everywhere, screaming. Ready, on, roll camera. No one does car chases better than Michael. I mean, they're incredible. Like, they're, you know, they're at Mach 3, and, you know, you feel like you're right in the middle of them. One of my shooting styles is using this little go-kart thing, where it goes very fast, like 100 miles an hour, and it's a very small, vibrating camera that's real low to the ground, and looks like a suicide vehicle. And we use that for anything from running down the street to chasing cars. It's a very powerful tool for getting in and around and close to the action. We use it quite a bit. Aaron <laughs> Skinner. Fun, huh? So good. Yeah. All right, let's not clip it now. Let's not clip the show. Thank you. Let me play that back again. It's pretty crazy being in the go-kart. I mean, because you're responding quick. And, um, you know, any mistake, and you could be in a lot of trouble. Tell you, I'm never going to be doing another highway chase again because I've I've now done highway chases. So the cows come home. I wanted to transform right under the uh, the on ramp. All right, so the next on ramp is where we're going to start the transformation. Okay. The highway chase is huge. I mean, we have tumbling cars, we have crashing cars, we've got cars upside down hitting cars, we've got scraping cars. But this one will top most of the ones I've ever done because now you've got robots transforming at 80 miles an hour on a freeway. And uh, I don't know how you can top anything like that now. All right, let's go try one, shall we? Yeah. We try to put the audience inside the action. So they're actually eating cars. They're actually in the crash. Come on, let's go. Maybe I should follow me. One, two, 
Watch out! Watch out! Yeah, We use the Bay Buster, that crazy triangle car uh, that can get actually take direct hits from cars. The Bay Buster is a pickup truck with a cage on the outside of it, and they mount anywhere from two to four cameras on the front. And if we have flipping cars or cars being thrown off the top of car carriers, I mean, we normally drive the Bay Buster right into it. It's great for the audience. That's part of that eat the action that the audience gets to see that's not CGI. It's like most directors would have chose when we ripped that bus, which is an extremely dangerous stunt, I mean, really dangerous, most would have just done it either miniature or CG. And it just, it just wouldn't look as good. I mean, the bus sequence is something that we've never done before, and I really had to push to get that to happen. That bus, we have, we have six exploding bolts holding the cab together in the center, in the center of the bus. And then we have big cables underneath, pulling it together, holding it together. We cut the cables and blow the bolts, and the actual bus cracks in half like an egg in two, in two pieces. There's a stunt driver and drives the front away because it's gonna drop down on another set of wheels so he can still control it. And then the back half has those same cannons in it that we're gonna fire at 1,100 PSI, three cannons, and the back half of the bus is gonna flip away. Wow, it's gonna be really cool. We're gonna pop the cable, which is the first cable pulling it. Then there's another cable wrapped around him, What's and it's gonna here? take about three seconds What's for that bus to pull like that, and then we blow the, 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 the thing. Once we pop the cable, it's all automatic. Richard, you have the bomb in your hand? I have bomb. Yeah, I have a button on the floor, yes. Okay, so Richard. He wants to be there. We're releasing the first cable when the bus comes out from under the bridge and gets into the sun. Come on, are we gonna make this an epic? Come on, guys, let's do this. Let's go. F this. Let's go. Come on. Copy that. Let's go. Come on, guys. Someone get in this charge vehicle and have it started because we're moving in position right now. Move those cars forward, Kenny Bates. So we put Richard Epper in the bus, and uh, I drove the, the Bay Bomber and chased it with four cameras on the front end. But no one really knew what the bus was going to do. All right, guys. I think it worked out really well, and I think it's because FX did a, an excellent job on the, prepping that bus for us. So it's like those guys are the guys that made us look good on that one. The main thing is, is uh, my good friend Richard Eppard safe, and uh, that's that's all I think about going down there. In the end, it's just a movie, but it's a it's a Michael Bay movie, and that's what we do. We get the bang for the buck when you're with Michael. Actually, no one was hurt on this movie. I mean, we've had a, a, a really spotless track record for such a long time, and uh, you know, knock on wood, because uh, it's a, you know, by the way, it's just a dangerous business. What we do, what they're doing, is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs>